Well, the heart transplant program at uh, the University of Maryland Medical Center is a complex animal. Um, it, it is pretty obvious that to do a heart transplant uh, requires um, things to go very well. And uh, not only does, does the heart transplant procedure require um, few, if any, errors, but the long-term treatment of a patient um, who has received a heart transplant requires tremendous coordination between many individuals. We have cardiologists, we have nurse coordinators, we have uh, pharmacists, we have surgeons, we have trainees, all involved to try to optimize a patient outcome. If anybody were to, to look at the, the challenge of creating a system to care for patients who have received a vital organ in transplantation, they would feel, I'm sure, that this is a pretty complex problem. As surgeons who perform these surgeries, we're basically writing a contract with our patients that says, not only are we going to stitch and sew and cut, but we are going to be sure that across the continuum of care, um, that we will take responsibility for providing, to the extent possible, an environment where the care can be delivered with an air-free experience. I find it daunting, but I find it actually impressive at the University of Maryland um, about the concern and care given over trying to create an air-free uh, environment. Some things that have happened in the organ transplant uh, program since I've been director of it has, have really made a huge difference. We have really isolated our operating room as, a, as an area of, of first potential air. And we do simple things, like before a patient goes to sleep, the transplant surgeon is there at the operating room table qualifying that this is my patient. And not only that, that this patient has a certain blood type and that he has spoken to the donor team who has also looked at the blood type of the donor to confirm that we don't have a mismatched organ. When we do lung transplantation, a little different subject, but the same thing. We have to be sure we are doing a left lung transplant, and that is the lung that is coming from the, the, uh, from the donor. Sounds like it would be simple, but sometimes with multiple transplants being done, the middle of the night, lots of communications, um, these simple things sometimes are missed. So we have a protocol now for all this to happen um, so we don't have to remember to do it. It's just done in a very professional way. Our nurses are trained not to start a procedure until these processes are completed. And then we have a check where we evaluate um, by our checklists whether or not there were any procedures that weren't done that we had agreed should be done. And then we look on our quarterly reviews to be sure that, in fact, those procedures are all taken care of. When a patient gets to the intensive care unit after a heart-lung transplant, it's a little bit like a pit stop. We go from the operating room to the intensive care unit, and all of a sudden, our car, which has this great new engine, all right, our patient, now has to be handed off to the pit crew. And the pit crew is the intensive care team, the nurses uh, in the intensive care unit, all the medications, all the fuel that was running the engine, uh, to get from the operating room through the operation and now to the intensive care unit, that all has to be transferred seamlessly. So the handoff is an area where Dr. Herr, our director of cardiac surgery ICU, has focused much of his attention to be sure that no medications are doubled or halved or forgotten about as that transition occurs, that the breathing machines are all functional, that the tubes are all where they should be, where the chest x-rays are all viewed early after the procedure. Following up on that, we have a very complicated set of medications that our patients require, medications that are life-sustaining for our transplanted organs. Many of the medications will conflict with other medications. As a consequence, the institution has permitted us to include as a full-time member, not part-time, not on consulting basis, but a full-time member of our team now includes somebody from the pharmacy 
So a PharmD rounds with our team every day to be sure that the levels of drugs that are um, required are at their appropriate le level, that any drug that might interact with another drug has been checked and double checked, and that any drug that might be toxic to our patient's kidneys or some other organ um, is appropriately dosed so that we don't run into those kinds of difficulties. Or if we are running into them, we recognize it early enough that we have the best chance of reversing a bad trend. In the outpatient facility, once our patient graduates from the intensive care unit, they then must walk the plank, if you wish, away from this cluster of highly intensive care and people who literally won't let them sneeze without coming in to sure, be sure they're all right, to home. Well, that's a very scary time. And so we've spent a lot of time on education uh, of the patient and the family. This is all part of the pre-transplant work, but in the post-transplant period, education about the medication you're expected to take, what you're supposed to call the coordinator for should you have a problem, um, the importance of compliance with your medication, and just a general education about how important those medicines are. Um, because the number one indicator of good outcome of any transplant program is the contract you have with your patient. Is the patient going to follow up on, on the care that is prescribed? So that compliance, again, is a very important issue for us there. Um, we have a, um, a wonderfully uh, motivated uh, group of individuals uh, that include nursing, um, uh, administrators, our physicians, and, and, um, and others who meet on a regular basis to review our outcomes. We set some standards that we'd like to uh, reach. Um, maybe it would be something like, all right, let's say we had 10 patients last year that had pneumonia after lung transplantation or after heart transplantation. Our target this year is going to be five patients only. And what are we going to do to reduce that risk? And so we will then set up, you know, best examples of best care to reduce infection of the lungs, and we're going to implement those new standards in our protocols of care. So as we get better and better, we find lots of things to start to look at. And hopefully the things we're looking at five years down the road are things that today really don't bother us very much because they may not be life critical. So as we begin this process of reducing errors and improving quality of care, we take the big problems on first. Those problems that if they're unattended might lead to a life-threatening complication. And then we can begin to work more at the periphery of the problems as we go down the road and then we just create a better process. I suspect there'll never be a best process ever finished here because as we include more and more treatment options like artificial hearts and blood pumps and, uh, and artificial lungs, we're going to run into whole new areas which require us to, to sit down and think about how we can deliver that care in the safest way. Yeah, I think that heart transplantation is a volume sensitive um, procedure. Um, heart transplantation um, is a fairly routine procedure done in most major medical centers. Those medical centers that have approached heart transplantation as an offering of a, of a serious nature, i.e. one which is a capstone perhaps to their program of treating heart failure, um, are those that tend to do more procedures. It's not just done casually by a surgeon that might be doing heart bypass surgery. It becomes, in essence, a surgical specialty and thus requires the same team to do it over and over again. And we all know that uh, the more often you do a procedure, most likely the better off you are in doing it. The numbers begin to fall out somewhere. If we look at the national data on how many heart transplants um, make you a better program, it falls out somewhere above 20. Uh, and those programs that do more than 20 heart transplants are in that, in that level, which would be the upper quarter, upper 20 percentile of the entire nation, are those programs that tend to have better outcomes. And I think it's a commitment issue. It's having enough people on board who are committed um, uh, for it and, uh, you know, the critical mass.